Hello, America, and to all of our listeners all over the world. You're listening to another exciting edition of Let's Weekend. I'm your host, the most Brandon Perkins. Joining me as always is Chris Logie. Say hi to the good people, Chris. Hello. Yeah, so this week's episode is going to be for October 26, 2024. It is a pre Halloween uh, episode, although Halloween doesn't actually happen until next Thursday. But when you hear from us, we will be in the, in the beginning of November again. So. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and sort of nail all that Halloween stuff in the bud right now. And you know what? I mean, it's not like we're the only ones who are doing Halloween super freaking early. <laughs> like it wasn't like they started bringing out all the pumping scu- stuff out at the, after the end of August or anything. Anyway, what have we got to talk about this week? Well, Rudy Giuliani is in some serious doo-doo, at least financial wise. Uh, the LA times editor and a bunch of other stuff has been happening with those newspapers. Also Washington post because they just basically told their, uh, editorial departments to go suck eggs about presidential endorsements. Um, we also have some news about the WNBA. Uh, we also have uh, some news about Boeing, because you may have heard they've been uh, having issues. And uh, we also have a bunch of entertainment-related stuff, including some trailers, some dates, uh, some news about stuff being removed from release calendars, and all that and more on this week's episode of Let's Weekend. So, to start us off, as always, uh, as is tradition, start off talking about all the things we've been doing up to this point this week. And it's also tradition... We start with Chris. Chris, what have you been doing this week? Well, it's not been um, a busy week, really. It's been kind of slow. Yeah. But I did manage to get out and vote early Mm -hmm. on a Friday morning, uh, which went pretty well. Basically went to the the Board of Elections here, which is in, uh, frankly, a very small parking lot of... Mm -hmm. Um, thing so they had cops and such helping people kind of cycle through and get to open spots and then get the help mm-hmm. afterwards uh so yeah mine took maybe like five minutes in and out to get what i needed done because it wasn't too hard to uh mm-hmm. make all my picks voted blue on everything mm-hmm. um and the the spots that were running unopposed uh republicans i just didn't vote for them Mm-hmm. And pick a spot, and uh, voted yes on issue one to uh, get an amendment to uh, stop gerrymandering or mm-hmm. minimize it as much as possible with an independent entity to handle that stuff. Um, yep. Rather than let the Ohio GOP do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was uh, a fun day. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. Um, where this is at is essentially like a, it's right next to the highway that has kind of one of those side roads mm-hmm. uh, for the businesses nearby to yeah. kind of hang out at. So people aren't going, you know, 50 side trying to get to these intersections. So, mm. um, so right across from where the board of uh, elections is at is a lawn that had just about every single sign for a local campaign mm. that you could expect. Um, yeah. I think the biggest one was a, a Harris Walls sign. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Trump fence one was hidden somewhere uh, that I found. But yeah, it's uh, it's good to finally have that done. I don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's uh, good to have that done. But um, yeah, for things I haven't been um, I've been doing outside of that, uh, I've been watching some things. I have Watch all the episodes of Agatha all along that mm-hmm. are, are on Disney Plus right now. I think we have the last episode coming up next week. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, following up from what happened in WandaVision, as Agatha is kind of trying to get her powers back and sort of enlist these uh, nearby witches that are not part of a coven to go with her on the uh, the mm. witch's road. And um, they go through a bunch of trials of sorts that test each person and their their capabilities, I guess, and their worthiness of going down this road. 
mm. um, which has been uh, pretty fun. A um, mm. couple of twists here and there uh, for who some of these characters might be, really, and all that. So, yeah, mm. pretty solid. Um, yeah. Looking forward to the last episode here next week, mm. uh, just in time for Halloween. And uh, that's been that. Um, also watched all of Tomb Raider, The Legend of Lara Croft mm-hmm. on Netflix, um, which is a solid animated show. Kind of essentially taking mm-hmm. the the general plot that those games tend to have, mm-hmm. uh, where Lara Croft is doing her thing, uh, finds out about these uh, stones of power mm-hmm. that are an ancient thing that grants uh, the people that get them, you know, some indescribable powers. Uh, there's four of them. And uh, her mm-hmm. rival of sorts um, ends up being the one that beats her to them and starts collecting them all and causing a bunch of crazy weather and damage wherever they go. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, kind of... Uh, uh, gets to a head as they fight each other directly. Mm-hmm. And Laura's kind of, this is the uh, reboot trilogy, Laura Croft. Uh, so she has the the big, like, wall climbing pick, pickaxe mm-hmm. thing um, is one of her main weapons, mm-hmm. as well as a bow and arrow and all that. Um, mm-hmm. And kind of her defining character trait is uh, being a loner, kind of not wanting others to directly help her. At a certain point, and she has to embrace her her fears, her insecurities, and such to accept help uh, in mm-hmm. taking down this guy and all that. And yeah, um, yeah, it's a it's a solid show. Um, all kinds of stuff. And mm-hmm. yeah, they, at the end, they get to go to a kind of unreal place that has, say, a bunch of the um, extinct animals that no longer exist on the rest of the earth. Mm-hmm. Gonna go through all that kind of supernatural stuff. So, uh, yeah, pretty solid show. Um, worth checking out if you like Tomb Raider. Just want an animated show that does some uh, fun stuff. The Tomb Raider license. And then uh, let's see. The last show I watched was uh, watched some more Steven Universe in the fifties somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, where uh, they finally start paying off some stuff they've been building up as they have a big sort of alien invasion of uh, at least one big ship from the Jim home world mm-hmm. uh, that sends this big hand shaped ship uh, to go take out the crystal gems mm-hmm. uh, to which, you know, they're not well built for this, the ship. So yeah, it makes for uh, a pretty cool couple of episodes there where they deal with the, uh, the main attack and um, the aftermath, because Stephen comes out of this um, realizing the the scope of what happened. And, uh-huh. um, potentially, anybody he cares about is going to be a potential target for uh, the home world that is going after them. Uh-huh. So he tries to uh, turn people away. Um, yeah, best friend Connie, and she's very much not wanting that. Mm-hmm. Kind of refuses to give up on him, in a sense. Uh, and they have a whole fun episode where they manage to fuse together, mm-hmm. and a weird thing in a way that the the other gems do not realize is possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, which kind of just makes them look like an adult, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird. But mm. yeah, some cool stuff. Um, but that's been pretty much what I've been watching uh, for. Things I've been playing, um, I decided to start Alan Wake 2 mm-hmm. as they put out a recent update uh, for their anniversary mm. of the release last year. And it had some really good accessibility options so that uh, you can kind of really neuter the the effect of the combat. To, mm. So the enemies that stalk around um, and make that uh, a less uh, scary game. Uh, mm-hmm. At least for that part of it, uh, they do have some other options for minimizing some of the uh, the weird jump scares they do. Yeah, which are all kind of really dumb from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Where it's just all of a sudden you're playing the game and then like a half second a weird 
picture shows up mm. of whatever the bad guy is kind of making a mean face or something like that. Mm. And it's like not really an interesting like jump scare in any way. It's just like, oh, mm. you just like loaded up an image real quick for some reason. Mm. Um, this seems like a very cheap thing to do. Um, but yeah, I've gotten through both of the intros for um, Saga and Alan Wake. Mm-hmm. As you sort of kick off the investigation with Saga Anderson and Alex Casey kind of trying to figure out what all is going on at this uh, uh, at Bright Falls. Because mm-hmm. they've heard of a, a dead body that's washed up in a, a very weird manner that seems tied to whatever they were doing before. Uh, mm-hmm. with, what they were investigating before with cult stuff. And uh, yeah, it gets real weird. And all mm-hmm. that, um, so much so that uh, the sheriff that is helping them, it's like, oh yeah, I have a bunch of more of these like manuscript pages mm. um, to give you, and then he just disappears in the middle of that. Yeah. Uh, to which you see him again a little bit later in Allen's dealing with the mm-hmm. the the dark places he's trying to escape after yep. fifteen years over there. Mm-hmm. Um. Which I would say so far is the worst part of the game, because I don't think his uh, combat is all that interesting. Um, So I have invincibility on, which means enemies don't do damage to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, the only thing they can do is like when they grab onto you to like knock you around or whatever, that's like the only thing I have Mm -hmm. um, that they can do to me. So uh, that particular area, you essentially are dealing with these weird like semi-transparent enemies that are just hanging around Mm. um and if you don't have your flashlight on you can uh sometimes walk past them Mm. Uh, sometimes they'll get aggro if you're too close to them or whatever or Mm. if you're running but other than that it's just not really satisfying combat in any way uh compared to like saga anderson where you're fighting more concrete enemies and such though I don't really like the the wolves that show up because they remind me yeah. of uh, what's his name Gamork from Never, the Never Ending Story. Yeah, but it's like oh yeah, it's a fucked up black wolf that's got glowing eyes mm-hmm. hanging out in these dark woods. Uh, no, uh, so I'm glad I have the invincibility off because those ones are particularly tough to deal with because they just kind of running around a bunch uh, and then mm-hmm. just dart at you. Uh, which can be mm. tough to see when you're in the woods with, uh, you know, bushes and whatnot blocking their, your view of them. Yeah. Um, this kind of makes the combat more manageable. Also makes mm. it easier in seeing like, oh, uh, you don't really have to worry about running out of bullets, really, because they have plenty of opportunities to either just straight up drop bullets mm-hmm. or you can find tons of stashes with... Yep. Uh, Randomly generating, you know, items in them depending on what you need. So if you're yeah. in need of, you know, pistol ammo, there'll probably be some pistol ammo in one of them or mm. health items, uh, that kind of stuff. Batteries, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm basically putting all the health items in uh, the shoe box because I don't really need them at this point. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not taking damage. And the help with that first boss fight with Nightingale. Um, which is a pretty cool sort of setup for a boss fight that kind of mm-hmm. has you running loops in the in this area and uh, running into a lot of tricky environments mm-hmm. um, as it's kind of throwing you through different uh, parts of this uh, like forest level area that um, is tough because the the boss kind of just runs away for good chunks of the time. And then uh, as you get close to him, he starts charging at you and you got to deal with that. Luckily uh, with invincibility, uh, the most that he does is just knocks you over kind of stuff mm-hmm. and um, makes it easier with the combat. Just sit there and just like, all right, I'll just pump some shotgun shells into you and just take some damage um, and beat it pretty uh, soon after that. But yeah, uh lets me kind of more focus on the story stuff that is mm-hmm. going on. And yeah, like the 
the the coolest part of the Alan Wake stuff is that you essentially go into these areas that you can mess with in your storyboard mm-hmm. um, section and just like, oh, well, here's the base version of this area, but here it is if the main hook is, you know, a missing FBI agent or mm. you know, the cult is here or the, the torch bearers or whatever else is there. Mm-hmm. Um, though it's annoying at times because I've had it where I didn't have anything I could do. It was just more navigating around and Alan just like, well, there's something I can do with the storyboards. And it's like, no, you're not in the area that it needs. Um, It's like, they kind of are hinting at things that you can't actually do. And it's uh, that kind of stuff is pretty annoying. Oh yeah. Um, It's less of an issue with Saga Anderson because you're, you're not having that kind of control. It's more just keeping track of what's going on around you and sort of, a lot oh. of like collectible based stuff, um, uh-huh. but you're also learning learning things about the cult and uh, the area and all that kind of stuff that you you oh. put stuff in. So there's sometimes where it's like, oh, there's this way that they can hint to how you do a puzzle, but none of the puzzles are all that difficult. Um, oh. The worst ones are like, oh, you need a number for this combination, and it's like, well, if you can get at least two of them, you can brute force it. Oh. Um, and others are like, oh, look around for where there's a number. And it's like, oh, the, the most inventive one was this employee roster list in the in the park. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, you have to note which ones they are talking about. And that's the number on the keypad that you have to hit. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, it's uh, nothing really too complicated uh, for mm-hmm. that stuff, which I imagine is because they're trying to make it pretty accessible. On that stuff, but uh, yeah, I got to the basically this the the part where it starts to open up as far as you can focus on Alan Wake's stuff or Saga stuff, Mm -hmm. um, which I'm mainly doing Saga stuff, going to the uh, the trailer park in Watery, uh, Mm -hmm. which is a whole weird place. It's a very small like fishing village kind of area Mm -hmm. that has the the theme park that is based around coffee mm-hmm. run by the two guys that one are definitely not American. Um, you can definitely tell they're just uh, people on the dev team that uh, were good on the camera. Mm-hmm. They're like We're just going to have them everywhere because they run mm-hmm. commercials for the various businesses they do where they make beer and run a, um, like an escort service to go uh, hiking around the, around the area mm-hmm. um, and they run a theme park and a trailer park. And you know, it's like, Oh my God, these guys, they look like they're disheveled weirdos, but they're secretly rich mm-hmm. and own much of these towns. So, um, but they have some very good like F and B commercials mm-hmm. uh, with a lot of dumb jokes and such in them that are pretty good. But uh, yeah, that's how I'm like too. pretty good stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to put some more time into that. Um, and the other one I've been playing a bunch of is Power Wash Simulator. Mm. I'm nearly finished with the Shrek DLC. I'm on the last um, job of that. Mm. I think most of this goes through uh, the first two movies, but the the last stage is just the dragon slayer that the, uh, the dragon hangs out at, which is from the first movie, and I don't know where else it shows up at. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically donkey and dragon are out on a trip and um, uh, donkey hires you to clean up. It's covered in soot and such all around the place. Mm-hmm. You just got a huge pile of treasure and statues and such in this room and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Um, uh, which is pretty fun to jump around and clean. Um, basically trying to do the, the last achievement here, which is to, not clean these tapestries, so I'm uh, just getting around there, trying to clean everything else but them, and then finish those up at the end. Um, yeah, what are the other... You need to clean Shrek's swamp, because uh, during the second movie, uh, Donkey and some of the other fairy creatures, or the fairy tale creatures, are hanging out in his house while he's leaving, and he just kind of gives up trying to tell him to get the fuck out at a certain point, so they've made a huge mess, uh, especially like a lot of pixie dust and such are 
all over the place, so it's very kind of colorful dirt. That is a uh, pretty unique for Power Wash Simulator stages. So, um, yeah, that's been fun, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you kind of pay attention to some of the uh, the movies and know sort of where these things happen at. That adds a little bit to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next thing I'll be doing is they added a Halloween stage. I think it's in a haunted house, so that'll be fun to work on. But uh, yeah, it's been pretty much it for me. So, Brandon, what have you been doing? Well, um, as for me, uh, I am just about finished with Metaphor Refantasio, and uh, yeah, that game is amazing, but I will tell you right off the bat, the last boss battle for that game is a freaking marathon. Like, it, it legitimately is. Um, because, and I, I've already tried it twice and died both times, so... But the last time took me close to half an hour <laughs> because I I really don't want to go too far into it because I really don't want to spoil anything. But basically, the last uh, boss ends up sprouting like three faces that you then have to kill each one of them. And the thing is, each one of these will occasionally have what they call a sacrifice where they'll eat like an effigy of one of the members of the party and it'll give them like a temporary magic boost where they can like unleash these really strong magical attacks that can like severely weaken the entire party. And on top of all that, you also, after you get rid of all three of those masks, you then have one last like actual fight where like the three faces split open and the actual face is exposed and he has like six uh basically six actions that he can use and sometimes he'll they'll use a uh a uh an ability that a lot of bosses one that you can eventually get to called soul screen where it'll give you like a couple of additional actions to use um so that's like a total of like nine actions that he can occasionally use to hit you with. Now, the good thing is, unlike some of the like the Persona games, if you end up like if anybody misses an attack or they successfully block an attack, that'll actually knock a couple of the actions off of the roster. So you can't. So it'll actually um, it might you know, prematurely in the turn. But that really only, you know, that, that that's kind of a one in six type of thing. It doesn't happen that often. Um, but yeah, it's a really, God, that this game is really is legitimately amazing. But on top of that, I've been taking advantage of my, my uh, PS Plus account and I've been playing... Good spake, specifically the new version, the version that came out recently. And, um, like, yeah, that game is, it is really good. Um, and it's definitely a lot more, um, intense than the original was. And the original was already pretty intense. Um, I haven't really gotten that far into it. All I will say, though, is that the very, unlike in the first game where it was like you could kind of see a lot of the enemies coming from a mile away, in this case, they will sneak up on you very quickly if you are not watching out. And they are so aren't. Uh, one of the like other differences was that in the original game, when they came at you to attack you, they would kind of slow down just to sort of give you a chance to you know, get your, get the plasma cutter in place so you can start dismembering them. Uh, not here. They will attack you on site and they aren't, uh, they are not too keen on giving you an advantage. So yeah, um, there is that. And, uh, other than that, you know, I'm just doing more music stuff. I started listening to visual K stuff again, cause I just felt like it and, you know, felt like the season to do it considering it's the spooky times and everything. And uh, really, other than that, we've also been having like some real like warm October weather this week. Um, 
it's been up in like the 80s today it was like 88 the high was 88 um and it's been relatively warm this week um but the thing is because you know it's georgia and it's the south yeah it could get up to you know 88 or whatever but when it gets nighttime it'll like drop down into the 40s (laughs) so you know it's hot days are hot and mornings and nights are fairly cool that's just sort of how it is down here but uh yeah um that's pretty much what i've been doing so is there anything you want to add want to add chris before we move on no no all righty then well in that case it's time for everybody's favorite part of the show brandon's random factoid and a couple a couple nights ago i sort of talked about uh pro wrestling and how um you know there was a point there was a time period when uh what we you know there, there was this time period where the idea of like having like a national sort of, uh, you know, wrestling agency, that, you know, promotion that was like cr- the whole country was actually a fairly new idea. Uh, up until like the early '80s, it was mostly like a bunch of like regional places. Um, until Vince McMahon finally gobbled them up. And so what ended up happening is that whenever any other uh, promotion wanted to get into to like the big dogs, they basically also had to go national. So that's eventually what happened to, say, like WCW. And that's also what ended up happening to Extreme Championship Wrestling, that is ECW. And what ECW did was they sort of... What, what they did that was different from the other ones is that they really doubled down on the grimier, more violent aspects of pro wrestling. Um, for for a long time, there's you know after you know the, the WWF really took off in the '80s, there was this new sort of phenomenon that started showing up called backyard wrestling, which would be essentially sort of circling around to from. To more or less to kind of like what pro wrestling's roots were, because for those who don't realize it, pro wrestling was originally a sideshow attraction. All right, it was it was a, it was carny stuff. Yeah, carny shit. Yeah, uh, and much like with other carny shit, it's crooked as all hell. <laughs> but um, the thing about like about the backyard stuff was. Because the WWF had been trying to make their whole promotions as kid friendly as they possibly could, a lot of the stuff that like a lot of old school pro wrestling used to have sort of went by the wayside. A lot of the like pro wrestlers in the WWF, they had like really cartoonish gimmicks and characters that they would go by with these really larger than life sort of superhero storylines and things like that. Um, compared to like a lot of like old school wrestling where, yeah, they had characters and everything, but they, a lot of the wrestlers tended to go by like their real names and, or had like regular normal names and they didn't have like outlandish costumes or anything. Um, and the other thing that a lot of them did was, uh, they would occasionally get a little more violent than say, than the WWF was willing to do. Uh, we're talking things like. You know, obviously, like with the WWF, the it, the the most extreme they were willing to go really was like a you know a chair shot to the forehead, and that was about it. You know, maybe Jim Duggan would be able to hit a guy with his two by four, and that's about it. But the backyard wrestling thing started did something even more extreme than that. They started doing stuff like having like uh you know like uh glass cylinders you know like the you know like the the industrial lighting type stuff those light bulbs and hitting them people and having people crash into them and you know throwing them on top of tables that had a bunch of those things on them or uh you know having you know bats with like razor wire on them or you know having uh the ring ropes being replaced with barbed wire you know, that would occasionally have uh, an, a mild electrical current going through it. Uh, you know, and this stuff original really, like, took off in places like in Japan. Because if you look at, like, what a lot of the pro wrestlers in Japan are willing to put up with compared to what wrestlers in the U.S. will do, what were willing to do at the time period, it's insane. And then comes ECW. 
And ECW basically took all of the grimy old violence and all the sort of readiness of the backyard wrestling, and they tried to make it mainstream. And they were wildly successful, but nobody wanted to touch them. And it wasn't, and they were, but they got really big and, and got to the point where in 1996, they were fixing to have their inaugural pay-per-view special. It was called Barely Legal. And then it ended up getting temporarily canceled. And the reason is because of something called the mass transit incident. Now, in the pro wrestling world, the mass transit incident is one of those things that has become the stuff of legends because a lot of the pro wrestling business essentially had to, was forced to make drastic changes because of what happened in this. But um, basically what you need to know is this. Uh, there in, on November 23rd in 1996, ECW was running what was called a house show. Now a house show uh, in pro wrestling terms is essentially a, a, wrestling event that is not televised it can be recorded you know by people in the audience but it is not publicly televised it's usually used as a way to like cash in on exposure and to sort of like do like a test like test audiences for like a reaction to potential wrestler new wrestlers or potential matches or matchups or storylines they may be thinking of it's kind of like the it's kind of like the pro wrestling equivalent of like workshopping something. And the, this particular match involved probably the guy who is considered the single most infamous figure in modern pro wrestling. And that is Jerome young, AKA new Jack, new Jack. When he was alive and he, he, he's not around anymore. He passed away a couple of years ago from a heart attack. New Jack was infamous for two things. One, for the absolute crazy shit that he was willing to get up with to make the match exciting. And two, for often taking it way too damn far. Um, New Jack was one of the f first wrestlers who, in the pro wrestling world, they call a, quote, garbage wrestler. That doesn't mean that they were bad. It means that they tended to really take uh, advantage of random foreign objects when it came to their matches. Um, and New Jack, when he was in the ECW, he was famous for basically dragging this garbage can into the ring that was loaded with all of these like random, like you know, pieces of like chain link and two by fours. Uh, bats with barbed wire wrapped around it, scalpels, uh, stuff like that. And he was infamous also for basically diving off of like insanely, basically insane heights to, you know, do like really crazy shit during matches. He famously... Uh, in two separate occasions, he wrestled another ECW star, Vic Grimes. The first time he did, Vic Grimes ended up uh, messing up one of the dives from it. He ended up landing on top of uh, New Jack's head and cracking his skull open. Um, and then the second time, New Jack ended up uh, fighting, doing Vic Grimes on a scaffold match, and he ended up throwing him off the scaffold and almost threw him onto the concrete floor that was like 40 feet below. Yeah, um, that was New Jack. Um, but New Jack was also, also I'll just straight up say it, New Jack was a straight up psychopath. Like legitimately he was. Anybody who ever like saw him do interviews, he, he showed no remorse for any of the shit he ever did. Um, and, like, the dude had, like, a legit rap sheet is what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, November 23rd, 1996, uh, Wonderland Ballroom in Massachusetts. Uh, ECW, they were getting ready to do this house show. And one of the matches at this was going to be a tag team match. It was going to be between Axel Rotten and Devon Dudley against the against the tag team group, the Gangsters. That was the tag team that was made up of New Jack and his partner, Mustafa Saeed. 
Unfortunately, Axel Rotten had to no show at the last minute because there was a family emergency. According to New Jack, it was like a death in the family, a bereavement, something like that. Uh, at the same time, there was also this other more novelty match that was going to happen between these two dwarf wrestlers, uh, guys named Tiny the Terrible and Half Nelson, against this guy named Eric Kulas, who at the time was performing at, under the name Mass Transit, where he was basically playing like a, like a pissed off bus driver that, you know, did wrestling on the side. Um, so when the news came out that Rotten wasn't going to be able to make it, Kulas de decided to step in and he went and he talked to Paul Hyman. Now, Paul Hyman was the owner and booker for ECW at the time. And he convinced him to fill in for Rotten by claiming that uh, he had wrestled for Killer Kowalski, who was a retired star wrestler who ran a notable wrestling school in the Boston, Massachusetts area. Um, just one problem. Uh, Eric Kulas was 17 at the time. He lied to Hyman, told him that he was, in fact, 19. So, strike one, right? Now, according to New Jack, he had attempted to actually tell Kul to dissuade Kulas to not go through with the match. Instead, Kulas asked New Jack to blame, to blade him since he had never done it himself, to which New Jack agreed. Now, if you're wondering what blading is, if you've ever seen one of those pro wrestling matches where there's blood everywhere, you know, guys are bleeding, there's, you know, stuff coming out of the head, you know, out of the face, the chest, all that stuff. A lot of that is caused not by like legit injury, but by blading where they'll usually have like a small little razor blade or, or uh, some type of sharp piece of metal that they will usually they'll have it wrapped in like a piece of like in like a towel or like a tablecloth or something where they can safely store it away out of sight. And so when uh, nobody is looking, they can just cut themselves with it and they'll start, you know, they'll start bleeding on command more or less. Um, and New Jack himself was famous for not only blading himself, but blading other people as well. Um Essentially, and also according to New Jack, something else that happened that uh, he really didn't like. Apparently, Kulas would, went over to him before the match started, and he said, like, here's all these things I want to do to you, you know, during the match. And uh, New Jack sort of took offense to that, because he felt like, that, you know, he was stepping over the line. So, during the match, uh, amongst other things that happened... Dudley and Devon Dudley and New Jack ended up brawling outside the ring while Saeed and Trance had fought inside the ring. And uh um with uh eventually the idea was to have like Dudley isolated outside the ring and told not to return because the idea was to then that they would end up ganging up on uh the other person in the tag team. So then the tag teams then double team Gulas inside the ring with New Jack pummeling him with crutches toasters, pieces of metal, and various other objects in the, uh, you know, the hardcore style that ECW was famous for. And then at the end of the match, New Jack then took out a surgical scalpel. At least that's what he said it was. It could have been something else. And he ended up cutting Kulas too deeply in the forehead. He screamed in pain, and then as blood poured out of his head, lost consciousness and passed out. Now, according to New Jack, he and according to the footage of the match, you can see New Jack sort of leaning in, is like, "Dude, you okay?" And Kulas sort of nods his head, like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm fine." Before he, you know, passes out. Um, and for the record, he didn't just cut him in the in the forehead; he cut two arteries in his forehead, which meant that he basically lost a shit ton of run of uh, a shit ton of blood during the time. Uh, so, after that was then done, the gangsters then proceeded to work Kulas even more with elbow drops and a bunch of other objects, finally prompting Kulas's father, who was in the audience, to scream, quote, Ring the fucking bell, he's 17. Medics then rushed into the ring to aid Kulas. New Jab grabbed the house microphone, and in an attempt to guard a heat, shouted, shouting, I don't care if the motherfucker dies. He's white. I don't like white people. I don't like people from Boston. I'm the wrong to fuck with. Um, by the way, I should point out that sort of New Jack's whole uh, thing was that he was like his sort of like um, 
gimmick was that he was basically a pissed off black militant from Los Angeles who was like, you know, and keep in mind, this was like during the years before and after the new, the uh, L.A. riots and stuff. So when he started out, he was in uh, a part of the country that was mostly white people. <laughs> Uh, you can kind of thank Jim Cornette for helping to develop, to basically create a monster, more or less. But anyway, um, so Kulas ended up getting rushed to the hospital. He had to get 50 stitches, um, and legal action was brought against New Jack. Uh, the pay-per-view event, Barely Legal, had to be canceled. Um, it was, and it would not, it would not air until the following year, 1997. Uh, and uh, this is from Wikipedia. According to Kulas and his family later gave an interview to the syndicated tabloid program Inside Edition, which featured footage from the incident. The segment depicted Kulas as an innocent, unprepared victim while vilifying ECW, even going as far as showing that Hyman had not asked for any state identification. The story was completed before the Kulases launched their lawsuit, so the key dates, details of how Luz Kulas actually got himself into the match had not been made public at that point. Three years later, New York New Jack was tried on charges of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and was later sued by the Kulas family. After hearing Kulas asked to be cut, a jury acquitted him, and he was later found not liable in civil court. Wrestlers testified that Kulas was extremely arrogant and demanding backstage prior to the match, and when told that he would have to bleed as part of the match, Kulas had asked New Jack to blade him since he had never done it. In the book, The Rise and Fall of ECW, it also states that at the medic crew carried Kulas out, he was escorted by Tommy Dreamer, who held his hand to comfort him. Passing by the audience, Kulas began giving them the finger in an attempt to, to quote, play the bad guy. Authorities later determined that Kulas had lied to Hyman about his age and experience. He claimed to be 21 years of age, but he was actually 17. He also claimed to have been trained by Killer Kowalski, and his father supposedly vouched for him. But Kulas was actually never trained to wrestle. In the rise and fall of ECW, Hyman says Kulas' dubious credentials as a student of Kowalski were endorsed by Tiny the Terrible. Kulas himself died at the age of 22 in 2002 due to complications from gastric bypass surgery. And it was featured on a 2020 episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Up to his own death in May 2021, New Jack did not express remorse for the incident. His final tweet on his Twitter account reiterated Kulas's request of the blading. So yeah, um, because of this incident, a lot of like the it not only like severely hampered ECW. It also essentially brought the whole sort of hardcore wrestling thing inadvertently into the mainstream, made it extremely controversial. It also brought the whole sort of backyard wrestling culture into mainstream attention as well. Um, and because of this, there's a lot of like new like legal shit that people have to go through if they're going to go through like one of these one of these matches. Like you got to do like legal disclaimers. You got to make sure to have you're legally required to have medics on standby. Um, just a bunch of shit like this. Um, and yeah, uh, that was the mass transit incident, and that was yet another installment of Brandon's random factoid. Um, but yeah, so. With that out of the way, it's now time to move on to the uh, show proper. And as always with the show proper, we start off with our assholes of the week. And our first asshole of the week is Rudy Giuliani. He has been ordered to turn over his New York City apartment and 26 different watches to the Georgia election workers that he currently owes $148 million for defamation. Yeah. Uh, so that's a hell of a list of stuff to um, turn over. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this is New York, New York City apartments, more than two dozen luxury watches, uh, and also a 1980 Mercedes once owned by movie star Lauren Bacall. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the U.S. District Judge Louis Lyman in Manhattan also <laughs> said Juliana does not have to give the election workers three New York Yankees World Series rings or mm-hmm. his Florida condominium for now, noting those mm-hmm. assets are tied up in other litigation. Uh, the property Juliana must relinquish is expected to fetch several million dollars for Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Wandria Shea Moss. Uh, they won the $148 million judgment over Giuliani's false ballot fraud claims against them. Um, 
And under Tuesday's order, Giuliani must turn over within seven days his Manhattan apartment, estimated at more than $5 million, as well as his interest at about $2 million that he says Trump's 2020 presidential campaign owes him for services. Also in the list of assets that must be given over to Freeman and Moss are 1980s Mercedes-Benz SL500, previously owned by Lauren Bacall, a shirt and picture signed, respectively, by Yankees legend Joe DiMaggio and Reggie Jackson, a signed Yankee Stadium picture, a diamond ring, costume jewelry, and 26 watches, including a Rolex, five Shinolas, two Belovas, and a Tiffany & Company. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he estimated the, the worth of the Mercedes at about $25,000, and the watches, World Series rings, and costume jewelry at about $30,000. Mm-hmm. The value of his sports memorabilia was unknown. One of those watches was given to Giuliani by his grandfather and asked that he be allowed to keep it because of the sentimental value, but the judge redressed, or rejected the request. So, mm. saying Giuliani could have had it exempted if he had proven it was worth less than $1,000, but he did not do so. Mm. So, good riddance to a bunch of his shit. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, he can't get more of it until other court cases are dealt with. So, yeah. That's fine. Mm. I guess the the World Series rings. Uh, his son Andrew Giuliani filed court documents that says those are his rings. Mm. This his father gave him four rings, one for each of the Yankees championships in ninety six, ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, as mm-hmm. gifts in twenty eighteen. Which seems like uh, the sort of thing you would do, like like you know when you're going to get a divorce that you sign a bunch of stuff over to your friends. Uh-huh. So that it can't be given out in the divorce, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Uh, that'd be funny if that's why all this stuff is hung up in legal battles. So uh-huh. there you go. Fuck Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, seriously. With a rusty spoon. Yeah. So and now we got the these two stories because the top brass of two different major publications essentially pushed out at the last minute and decided to not uh, put forth presidential endorsements. Starting off with the L.A. Times, the editor resigned after the paper's rich owner blocked their Kamala Harris presidential endorsement article. This came on the toes of the Washington Post suffering the same issue as Jeff Bezos blocked their endorsement of Kamala Harris. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the thing that people worried about uh, mm-hmm. with uh, rich owners owning these newspapers that they can sort of whenever they want, you know, block uh, editorials going up mm-hmm. uh, because it interferes with their financial interests. Yeah, uh, which in this case is because Trump has been saying lately that he is going to go after. Uh, any media that's been talking, you know, mess about him mm-hmm. if he wins. Uh, and I guess these guys are very much in uh, trying to stay on Trump's good side, I guess, which is dumb because one, nobody really cares about new to- uh, uh, newspapers, you know, endorsements. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, this is the Streisand effect for both of these papers. Is yep. that they could have just let those go out and nobody would have cared because nobody reads newspapers or, you know, makes their decisions based off of these newspaper companies mm-hmm. uh, putting out their endorsements. Yep. Uh, there's maybe more value in the like lower ballot stuff mm-hmm. uh, on that. But yeah, nobody's like, Oh, I'm going to vote Kamala Harris because the LA times said they endorse her. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, now you know that they're, Owned by that, and a lot of people that have been subscribing to these papers have canceled them as mm-hmm. a result, showing their uh, disinterest in supporting them, mm-hmm. um, which obviously does not hurt the rich owners in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, it more makes the the people that are still there more vulnerable to cuts and such, but also it's not like that's a guaranteed mm-hmm. thing either way on mm-hmm. that stuff. So. Yeah, it just kind of makes this uh, a shitty situation, and the the reason that nobody really thinks of these media organizations as really independent if they can't do one boring editorial without the the owners getting uh, involved in blocking it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, there you go. There's the 
uh, the owners of the LA Times and the Washington Post deciding to burn their papers down essentially over uh-huh. uh, a minor editorial. Uh-huh. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. And now for another group, that a couple that are just genuinely awful. Uh, the, this couple ran this funeral home that had 190 decaying corpses, and it has been indicted on 15 federal counts related to both wire fraud and conspiracy charges. Yeah, this happened in Colorado. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to see if there's a specific place here, but yeah, they run the Return to Net, Return to Nature funeral home. That touted its services being more natural, pledging to cremate or bury bodies without using embalming fluids or metal caskets. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the process, they ended up taking on way more jobs than they could handle. Mm. And rather than deal with that as best they could, they seem to uh, just try to get as much money as they can and run. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they're accused of taking money from customers and a pandemic relief fund. And spending it on themselves, paying for things like travel, plastic surgery, and expensive cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been charged with numerous state and federal crimes. In April, they were indicted on 15 federal counts related to wire fraud and conspiracy charges. Mm-hmm. Um, they had been set to begin a jury trial on the fraud charges last week. But as that date approached, they asked to change their pleas uh, to guilty uh, after mm-hmm. hearing where victims' families were able to listen by audio conference. Uh, the plea agreement, which stipulates that prosecutors will not request over 15 years imprisonment, mm-hmm. so it has to be approved by the judge, and it's yep. unclear when that will happen. Uh, federal prosecutor, prosecutors said the pair operated two fraudulent schemes that together netted just under $1 million. On one hand, they funneled $882,300 from a COVID-19 relief fund for businesses. On the other, they victimized customers who paid for their loved ones' remains to be treated legally and with respect, um, but in reality... Uh, the Halfords funeral home turned into a macabre and ghoulish house of horrors. The mm-hmm. bodies are stacked like cordwood and left to decay and decompose. Mm. And yeah, um, yeah, the cops uh, about a year ago had to check on the place because people had discovered or had noticed a horrific odor coming from the, the facility. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's uh, some fucked up shit. And I guess also part of this in October 2020. Uh, the husband sent a text telling his wife that they had four possible options. Build a new crematory machine, dig a hole and use lie on the bodies, burn the bodies in a hole, or D, I go to prison, which is probably what's going to happen. Mm. So they seem to saw, see this coming. Mm. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. So we have that. That happened. Uh, we also found out this week that Russia is getting help from North Korean troops in its war on Ukraine, which is kind of a sign of just how badly it's going for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As uh, there's been talks of the, the EU needing to beef up its uh, defense mm-hmm. systems because, you know, Russia may come calling for them at some point, but. Uh, this war in Ukraine has not gone well for them at all because they mm-hmm. probably expected to steamroll them uh, early on. And now we're here at least, what, two years later? Mm-hmm. Two and a half years later, that almost three years um, being like, well, this is kind of just a dumb stalemate at this point. But mm-hmm. until Russia wants to concede and just back off, uh, they're going to continue to get funding there. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least unless Trump gets into power, because he's not going to go against his buddy Putin mm-hmm. at all. But, uh, yeah, the U.S. said Wednesday that 3,000 North Korean troops have been deployed to Russia and are training at several locations. Mm-hmm. On the move, very serious and warning that those forces will be fair game if they go into combat in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the point raises the potential for the North Koreans to join Russian forces in Ukraine and suggest expanded military ties. Between the two nations as Moscow seeks weapons and troops to gain ground in a grinding war that has stalemated after more than so yeah, that's uh definitely a uh not great evolution of this war, but I don't know that it's going to really change too much unless mm-hmm. these soldiers are somehow super soldiers or something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's gotta be wild to be sort of in a sheltered uh country like that and being told like you're going you know, thousands of miles away to go fight a Russian mm-hmm. war. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, Israel conducted a retaliatory airstrike against Iranian military targets. Um, yeah, as they just continue to be kind of a wild card in the region now. Just yeah. going after various fronts now. Yeah. Um, apparently, it was largely... It, it, they didn't really do much, uh, really any serious damage. Uh, there's not been any news of any civilian casualties or anything. So, yeah, it just... It, it was like a... It was sort of like, you know, throwing a glass against the wall. Like, sure, there's damage and there might be a stain on the wall, but nobody's got hurt and it just makes them look like petulant little children. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, that's about it for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but fortunately, we do have Heroes of the Week to uh, sort of coincide with all that awfulness. And, wow, that was a lot. Uh, our first Heroes of the Week are the players of the WNBA Union. They have opted out of their collective bargaining, bargaining agreement to aim at securing higher salaries for players. Yeah, the WNBA Players Union has opted out of their collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. um, because the WNBA has done incredibly well after this most recent season, mm -hmm. um, setting records in attendance and rating ratings. Um, and that, yeah, the, the league has embarked on an ambitious expansion plan to build on this year's success mm -hmm. with a new team set to debut next season, followed by two more in 2026. Mm -hmm. uh, a new media rights agreement reached the summer has multiplied the league's TV revenue for years to come, mm -hmm. uh, but salaries have yet to reflect that success. Uh, the current union agreement provides for a rookie uh, minimum salary of $64,154. Mm -hmm. To a veteran supermax of two hundred forty-one thousand nine hundred eighty-four dollars, um, and as a result, many players spend the WNBA off-season playing in international leagues to supplement their income. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, the president of the WNBPA is uh, Seattle Storm forward Neka Oguamike, who mm -hmm. is they saying if we stay in the current agreement, we fall behind. Opting out isn't just about bigger paychecks, it's about claiming our rightful share of the business we built, improving mm -hmm. working conditions, and securing a future where the success we create benefits today's players and the generations to come. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this uh, opt-out allows for the current agreement to remain in place through the next season in 2025. If the league and players are unable to reach a new deal within a year. Mm -hmm. Work salvage could begin after next year's season comes to a close. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, wishing the best for them to get better pay and benefits for uh, them and their teammates. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe yeah. they'll be able to afford flying private mm -hmm. instead of doing what they have been flying like public flights and having to deal with uh, occasionally some just jerks um, in the airports and such. Yeah. Seriously. Like too close access to them. Mm -hmm. um, and the other hero of the week we've got is of course, the current president, Joseph R. Biden, made a public apology for the U.S. government's running Native American boarding schools. Yeah, it turns out Canadians weren't the only ones who did this yet. <laughs> we yeah. did them, too. Yeah. Um, they had federal government ones. Yep. I think also ones that were run by the church, uh, the Catholic church, mm -hmm. uh, much like in Canada. Um, but yeah, he has uh, had a big thing here saying the, the federal government has never, never formally apologized for what happened. I formally mm -hmm. apologize as president of the United States of America for what we did. Mm -hmm. It's long overdue. And calling this one of the most horrific chapters in American history, mm -hmm. uh, where they ran more than 400 schools that for over 150 years separated tens of thousands of American Indian, American Native, mm -hmm. Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children from their parents in order to assimilate them and exposing them to abuse or even death. Mm -hmm. Biden said that most Americans do not know about the government's role in this. Uh, because it's generally not taught in most school books. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the report from the Interior Department found at least 973 children died in the schools. Uh, the Interior, Interior Department report also called for an official apology, among other recommendations. Mm -hmm. As he said here, we do not erase history. We remember so we can heal as a nation. Uh, which I believe during this speech, there was a uh, person who interrupted talking about uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. 
He was very much like, let her speak. Don't do anything to her, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Letting her say her thing. So uh, ultimately good overall. Um, mm-hmm. Something needs to be addressed at some point and better late than never, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah, better to acknowledge this, apologize, and uh, work towards making things better for the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Mm. So yeah, we got that. So with that, we're moving on from the show proper to the proper show proper. And our first major story for the night is that the Biden administration is proposing a new rule that is requiring insurance companies to cover cost of contraceptives. Contraceptives, yeah. not contraceptives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they expand access to contraceptive products, including making over-the-counter birth control and condoms free for the first time. Mm-hmm. For women of reproductive age who have private health insurance. Yeah. Uh, this is under the proposal by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Labor Department, and Treasury Department, uh, which was announced by the administration on Monday. Health insurance companies will be required to cover all recommended over-the-counter contraception products, mm-hmm. such as condoms, spermicide, uh, emergency contraception, without a prescription and at no cost. Mm-hmm. It also require private health insurance providers to notify recipients about the covered over-the-counter products. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the proposed rule comes as the Biden administration seeks to expand access to contraceptives and other reproductive health, mm-hmm. including access to abortion, has become a central issue in the, the presidential election here. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that is uh, great news. Mm-hmm. Uh, making it easier for people to get access to this stuff. Although convenient that it's mainly intended for women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're the ones already already going there for birth control pills and that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. an easier time versus getting guys to go to pick up con- condoms, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So that sounds like a good idea. Just, you know, hope that, you know, they know how to properly use all that stuff. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, like, you know, if if you got, you know, at least somewhat okay sex ed when you were a teenager, then you do more or less know how to use all that stuff, you know, like, you know, especially with the condoms, because uh, there is like a specific way you have to put them on and you have to be careful about things like them tearing or stuff like that, you know, um, just if just just if, if you're if you're a health teacher slash you know, gym coach whips out a pickle or a banana or a cucumber, you know what's hap- going to happen. I'm just all I'm going to say. Anyway, um, next story. Uh, the Department of Justice attorneys are calling out the hypocrisy for the t- attorney general's handling of crimes committed by Israel. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically uh, calling out the glaring gap between the department's approach mm-hmm. to crimes committed by Russia and Hamas. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus the department's silence on potential crimes committed by Israeli forces and civilians. Mm-hmm. Um, they put out this four-page letter explicitly calling on the department to investigate potential crimes mm-hmm. committed by Israeli soldiers and civilians, including the killings mm-hmm. of American citizens in, in the West Bank and Gaza. Mm-hmm. Uh, saying here, in prosecuting crimes committed by Russia, Hamas, and other wrongdoers, the department has mm-hmm. appropriately demonstrated its commitment to upholding the rule of law in the midst of ongoing geopolitical con conflicts, but against the backdrop of numerous potential violations of U.S. law by individuals and entities affiliated with Israel, the department's silence and apparent inaction is a stark omission. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that seems like a reasonable uh, request to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd be better about that stuff because mm-hmm. you know, uh, a number of uh, U.S. citizens have been killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, let's see, four U.S. citizens killed this year in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Uh, the families, mm-hmm. uh, the victims' families, say by Israelis, despite demands from the Americans' families that the department investigate. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they they signed this anonymously uh, as your colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's a uh, uh, a good plea for some better coverage of this stuff. Uh, especially for uh, Israel mm-hmm. and their crimes. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's happening. Uh, then we got this little story from Boeing. Boeing posted a humongous $6 billion loss 
as they're striking workers want a new contract. Now, obviously, Boeing is going to get, you know, is has had to deal with a lot of shit this the last couple of years because of their terrible business practices. Uh, but then now they've got, you know, workers on strike as well. So obviously they've lost a ton of money because of their stupidity. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like the, uh, the loss here is on the, the execs here making bad mm-hmm. decisions in the name of, you know, making as much money as possible over the notion of doing their business correctly mm-hmm. and making safe products for their contracts mm-hmm. uh, that they need to. But yeah, this strike has been in its sixth week. I believe they just shot down a uh, contract that was offered this past week. So they are continuing to uh, push for a better deal. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the even before this strike, the company was grappling with production and quality control issues that limited production of its best-selling 737 line. Mm-hmm. Um, the company also reported major losses in its defense and space business. Mm-hmm. Uh, their new CEO has announced plans to re- lay off roughly 10% mm-hmm. of its workforce. Uh, so yeah, they are working to try to get their money back in order. But yeah, uh, they really need to be paying their people better and putting more of a focus on you know quality work versus uh, fast work and all that. So. Hmm. Yeah. 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 And speaking of honestly kind of shitty airlines, America Airlines has been fined fifty million dollars for its treatment of passengers with disabilities. Yeah, this is uh terrible to hear. Mm. Um citing numerous serious violations of the laws protecting airline passengers with disabilities. The US Department of Transportation fined American Airlines fifty mm. million dollars on Wednesday. Mm. Uh, This follows an investigation by the DOT that found violations at American over a four-year period between Mm -hmm. 2019 and 2023. Uh, They say it uncovered cases of unsafe physical assistance that at times resulted in injuries and undignified treatment of wheelchair users, in addition Mm -hmm. to repeated failures to provide prompt wheelchair assistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, The investigation also determined American mishandled thousands of wheelchairs by damaging them or delaying their return. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, as P. Buttigieg said, uh, the era of tolerating poor treatment of airline passengers with disabilities is over. Mm-hmm. With this penalty, we are setting a new standard of accountability for airlines that violate the civil rights of passengers with disabilities mm-hmm. by setting penalties at levels beyond a mere cost of doing business for airlines. We're aiming to change how the industry behaves and prevent these kinds of abuses from happening in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that is um, good news. Uh-huh. Uh, we've definitely seen some examples of this, of these issues. Uh, even recently, there have been uh, some of those that have popped up for different airlines where they just uh-huh. don't either train people too well or they the people they do hire seem to have uh, some serious issues with disabled people and helping uh-huh. them get on the uh, that they really should not have. Uh-huh. So they want money, and guess what? Disabled people have money to spend as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That we do. Um, so, yeah. Uh, got what you deserve, jackasses. Anyway, moving on to other people getting what they deserve. Olivia Nuzzi has left New York Magazine after her relationship with RFK Jr. became public. Yeah. Uh, they have parted ways. Uh, Olivia Nuzzi a month. Uh, uh, yeah, after a month. uh after she placed, she was placed on leave over a previously undisclosed relationship with then presidential candidate mm-hmm. Robert F. Kennedy. Um, yeah, they announced last month that she had violated its standards around conflicts of interest and disclosures by engaging in a relationship with a former subject relevant to the 2024 campaign, mm-hmm. while reporting on the election, which she would not have permitted to cover, been permitted to cover if leadership had known. Mm-hmm. Uh, which people figured out it was RFK pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think I saw somebody, uh, note that, um, she had a relationship with, um, I forget who it was, um, Mm -hmm. uh, but another, uh, journalist, I think it usually at CNN or somebody, Mm -hmm. um, she was 21 and he was 55. Mm -hmm. It's like, so she must have a thing for older men. Mm -hmm. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but it's. 
there's also a power imbalance uh, mm-hmm. in some of these, which, yeah, that's, uh, I think it's not great, especially when you're in the media mm-hmm. covering the uh, presidential campaigns. You know, that's a big no-no there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, she's going to be out of a job for a while. I'm sure somebody will pick her up eventually, but mm-hmm. probably not for a while. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we're moving on to one of those stories that's actually extremely unusual. Uh, there's been a big outbreak of E. coli at McDonald's across the country due to its raw onions. Now, there have been other fast food chains that have had like foodborne illness issues. You know, Taco Bell has every, you know, every few years had issues where, you know, their lettuce or some of their produce ends up spreading some sort of foodborne illness or Chipotle ends up having it. McDonald's actually, this is extremely unusual for because those guys are like the super wizards of food engineering that yeah. this actually managed to happen to them of all people. Uh, shows, you know, how, well, just, just, just read the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's an E. coli outbreak that has been linked to McDonald's signature quarter pounder hamburgers. Yeah. That has sickened at least 75 people across 13 states. Yeah. Um, yeah, at least 22 people have been hospitalized, including two people has since developed serious complications mm-hmm. that can lead to kidney failure. Uh, potentially after consuming fresh onions on the hamburgers sourced from the mm-hmm. California-based Taylor Farms. Uh, CDC previously reported that 10 people had been hospitalized. I believe one person has died, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, traced back to their their source for onions. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it has nothing to do with the, the dumb little publicity stunt that Trump did where he worked at uh, McDonald's for... An afternoon, yeah. which they paid to have it shut down for the day, mm-hmm. and the workers home. Yep. And literally, the food they had was uh, stuff they bought earlier, and then just reheated in a microwave. Yep. So Trump wasn't actually working a like the fry machine, yeah. or anything. Yeah, and you could tell he was because he had no. You could tell he not only was he not doing, but he had no idea how to work it. Because I've yeah. worked the fryer before. All right. <laughs> And you don't work a fryer like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have the scars on my arms to prove it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So, like I said, though, for McDonald's, this is extremely unusual. Because, like I said, you can say what you want about their business practices or their product. But pretty much of all the major you know, fast food chains, they're the ones who are probably the most hardcore about making sure that their products are safe to eat. So yeah. the idea they would have a food board illness issue is it's, it's just, it's, it's, it, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So yeah. Um, fortunately for them, uh, I've never, I don't like onions on my, so it wouldn't have been a problem for me. Yeah. Um, and especially not those little weird little sliver mini onion shit that they put on those things. Ugh. But anyway, moving on from there, Harvey Weinstein has been diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. Boo fuckity who? Yeah, sucks for him, but also he's been such a shitty person that uh-huh. nobody has sympathy sympathy for him uh, with this. So yeah, mm-hmm. I'm sure they'll try to use this as a means for him not to go to jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe get found, I don't know, with some mm-hmm. sort of judgment to not have to go to jail. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really deserve any sympathy in all this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this he almost died following his emergency heart surgery that we talked a while back. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, he had COVID uh, at least a couple times, so uh-huh. I'm sure that didn't help at all. But yeah, there you go. Uh-huh. Maybe he'll die soon and just save everybody the trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway. And now for something that is just going to piss you off by just how petty it is. The cable industry trade group has sued the Federal Trade Commission to block their click to cancel rule. Because apparently they make so much money out of straight up conning people. Yeah. Uh, The NCTA 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the Internet Te- and Television Association joined by the Electronic Security Association, representing mm-hmm. companies in the electronic life, safety, and security industry, mm-hmm. and the Interactive Advertising Bureau mm-hmm. filed the lawsuit on October 22nd in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, mm-hmm. uh, seeking an order vacating the FTC's click to cancel rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is designed to let consumers more easily cut the cord on subscriptions without having to call people or go through complicated mm-hmm. and all that. Um, as it says here, petitioners respectfully request that this court hold unlawful, vacate, and join, and set aside the final rule and provide such additional relief as may be appropriate. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they're trying to stop this from uh, going through and, you know, uh, keeping them from having to do anything, mm-hmm. uh, which is not uh, how this should all go. But the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is the, mm-hmm. the kind of rogue uh, circuit that could go with their way on mm-hmm. this front. So we'll have to see how this goes. And if it uh, eventually fails, then uh, we know who to blame for it. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're uh, now moving on to the entertainment portion of the show. Uh, our first entertainment story is Spider-Man will be back with Spider-Man 4 after Tom Holland agrees to return. Yeah, somebody breaks the dreaded Spider-Man trilogy curse. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we now have a new Spider-Man movie from Tom Holland coming. Uh, it's set for July 24th, 2026. I believe mm-hmm. it will be filming early next year so Mm -hmm. uh we'll have to see how that goes but yeah that should be uh cool to see because yeah the last one definitely uh left them off in a in interesting places he essentially got the the whole world to forget who spider-man is who Mm -hmm. peter parker is and uh now has to decide what to do with his life after that um Mm -hmm. Uh, either find a means to get back into his friends' lives or mm-hmm. uh, continue to uh, do his thing as just Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we'll have to see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, we also found out that Marvel's Blade has, in fact, been removed from their release calendar because apparently just they just cannot get this damn movie out. <laughs> yeah, they can't seem to... Find people that will actually be able to make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the only steady thing has been Mahershala Ali's been ready to do it, but yeah, uh, it was dated for November seventh, twenty twenty five. But instead, Disney has replaced it with Predator: Badlands, the sixth mm-hmm. film in that franchise, mm-hmm. and they added three untitled projects to the schedule for twenty twenty eight for Marvel movies. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's other stuff going on, but yeah, Blade just doesn't seem to be able to get off the ground. Yeah. Because it had multiple directors exit the film and all that, so yeah. Mm-hmm. You think a man that fights uh, fights uh, Draculas and vampires mm-hmm. should be easier to do than whatever has happened here implies. They might get that game out before they ever get a movie out. Mm-hmm. Which would be wild, concerning how long games take to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, speaking of game related stuff, Netflix has renewed Tomb Raider The Legend of Lara Croft for season two. Yeah, should be cool. So apparently uh, it it's done really well. Yeah. And it's uh, set up for that pretty well because mm-hmm. you had the, they ended on a cliffhanger of uh, one of Lara's buddies has disappeared. Mm-hmm. And Presumably she's going to go after her and see what mm-hmm. gets going on with that. Um, mm-hmm. As it kind of hints at here, the log line. Mm-hmm. Um, when adventurer Laura Croft discovers a trail of stolen African Orisha masks, she joins forces with her best friend Sand to retrieve the precious artifacts, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. She goes all around the globe, uh, discovers the secret history, and uh, all that kind of stuff of the, the evil rich guy that's uh, wants some for themselves. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's your Tomb Raider story. That's a huge surprise. So, yeah. There you go. That should be cool. Mm-hmm. Probably out in a couple years. So, there you go. Yeah. 
Uh, and now for trailers, we got an official trailer for Creature Commandos, uh, which is this uh, James Gunn vehicle that's an yeah. animated feature. Kind of a, a Suicide Squad, but for non-human characters. Yep. As they basically go to a prison, max security prison for mm-hmm. um, various creatures and non-human entities. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of which at least is was human, but had a big radiation accident that caused him to turn into like a nuclear dude, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well as one, it's a robot that fought Nazis in World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's like a, a Bride of Dracula kind of character, uh, a weasel dude, and I forget the last one. Oh, Fish Woman, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, looks super bloody and violent, like you might expect. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that could be cool. Um, it'll be starting on Max December 5th. Uh, so, yeah, that looks like that'd be cool. Mm-hmm. It also seems very much like, oh, we did Suicide Squad, but for other characters mm-hmm. that you haven't heard. So, yeah, there you mm-hmm. go. Yeah. And last but not least, we got an official trailer for Hot Frosty. Yeah, this is one of the Netflix holiday movies. Yep. They've got a couple like rom-com type stuff. This is one of them mm-hmm. with uh, Lacey Chabert, who, uh, let's see, two years after losing her husband... Kathy, uh, Lacey Chabert, magically brings a handsome snowman to life mm-hmm. with her scarf that, um, through his naivete, the snowman helps Kathy to laugh, feel, and love again as the two fall for each other just in time for the holidays and before he melts. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a pretty fun little uh, trailer they have here. Mm-hmm. There's also a Mean Girls reference because I think she... Sees the TV with the uh, Lindsay Lohan thing on, and she's like, I went to high school with a girl that looked like that. Mm-hmm. So there's some of that. I think one of the other ones involves a woman trying to go to a Pentatonix uh, Christmas Eve show. Mm-hmm. And the tickets are all sold out, so she tries a bunch of ways to get tickets and ends up falling in love with the guy that helps her. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's that uh, kind of stuff. And there's another Lindsay Lohan. Holiday movie, mm-hmm. uh, which I think, yeah, she finds out that um, yeah, two resentful exes are forced to spend Christmas mm-hmm. under the same roof after discovering that their current partners are siblings. Mm-hmm. So she goes to uh, the holiday uh, thing with her uh, partner's family and finds out that uh, his brother is her ex, mm-hmm. fiance, and then. Also, the mom is Kristen Chenoweth, so she deals with... Uh, so, yeah, they got some decent-looking stuff for the holidays. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, uh, with that, I do believe we've got ourselves a show, folks. Yes, we do. We have got ourselves a show. So, if you like what you... If you uh, have been listening to us and you have a question for us to answer, or you have something you want us to read on the air, get in touch with us at Let'sWeekenders at gmail.com. We got here... Link for you, let's weekenders at gmail.com. It's right there on the show notes. Also, on top of Apple Podcasts, you can catch our little unscripted shenanigans at TuneIn, Google Play, RSS, archive.org, or pretty much any kind of you know podcast aggregator you can think of. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and wind it down here. Uh, thank you, Chris, for once again joining me on this little endeavor. Uh, for all of our listeners, both new and veteran, if you like what you hear, if you like the sounds that emerge from my mouth space, Please do not hesitate to share us with your friends, your family, your casual acquaintances, your co-workers, your mortal enemies, or everyone in between. Because they may hate you, but they may end up liking us. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and end it here. Uh, when you hear us next, we will officially be in November. And we will be like, what, like four days away from when the election happens. Yeah, and I think the, was it next weekend that we roll clocks back? Yep, I do believe it is. So, not only is it going to suddenly be getting darker earlier, but it's also going to be, well, I just let's just say the next uh, week and a half is going to be eventful. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Yeah, since I went and voted early, I still get those flyers, and I'm getting like four a day now. Yep, Telling same here. People, and it's like, stop. 
Yeah. I've gotten two that are just for Republicans. They're like, Republicans need to vote early. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm registered independent, so I don't get yeah. specific ones from just one party. I get both. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like, it, 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 uh, that's us too. We get like three or four of them basically every day the mail goes out. It's like, this is so wasteful. It is. They waste so many trees <laughs> putting is that it, shit why out. Why do you have to send me, I probably have at least 20 from each of the candidates. Yeah. It's like, you don't need to tell me that much. Yeah. I only want to know what party you're from. That's yeah. It. This is why I wish we did what they do in Canada where, you know, a presidential camp- campaigning can only last like two or three weeks maximum yeah but then the usps will probably lose out on a bunch of money and they already don't have enough money as it is that's true good night everybody